slides. So I'm Carl Stamer, Director of Digital Scholarship at the UC Davis Library. I'm also the uh, Associate Director for Humanities of the Davis Data Science Initiative. And um, those are still not my slides, so I'll just keep talking and hopefully they'll show up. Um, the big opening slide says UC Davis all on it. So um, I'm real lucky it's just thinking about the interdisciplinarity of it. The situation I work in, uh, I sit in the data science initiative right next to me in the office right next door to me is a statistician. The one on the other side on that works in bioinformatics. The one next to that is a computer scientist. We share graduate students that run the mix from, I should say, I'm originally a professor of English. I have English graduate students, sociology graduate students, computer science graduate students. You pretty much design, you name it. It's an extremely interdisciplinary space in the sense that we all work on each other's projects. Projects come in and we sort of decide as a group, like are we, is there you know, something in this for everybody? And that's how we tend to work. So um, it, it's really been great. Uh, my title here is ambitious in the sense that it's a plea to build a worldwide library more than a statement of what's happening. Um, specifically, the project that I'm going to be talking about here that this grows out of is the English Broadside Ballot Archive. It's, uh, NEH has been funding us now for 14 years. We just got our uh, next round of funding to bring more into the archive, so thank you, NEH. And they also funded a startup grant that was the launch of the image recognition stuff that I'm going to be talking about. So for those that aren't uh, real familiar with broadside ballads, I, so I work basically in street art from the 16th and 17th century, right? And I mean, that's, and that's not an exaggeration. These things were printed, Tessa Watt, who's sort of the, the authority on this, in the millions per year. Um, you know, they were just hugely prolific, and they have a standard form, which is the combination of an image, my um, pointer, uh, text, frequently a tune, they'll be like to the tune of that's designated. So they're multimedia artifacts of the 16th and 17th century. Um, and the images, the woodcut images, sometimes engravings, mostly wood blocks, were repurposed um, all the time in totally different contexts. They would get used over and over and over again, sometimes in a way that this is always about a king, right? And so I'll use a picture of the king, and I have, you know, 150 of these that are all laudatory examples of the king. Um, and then I have one that's that exact same image, and it's a story of, um, you know, this cuckold and all of the, you know, bad behavior going on. And then, and everybody in the world, of course, knows that that's a picture of the king, but when the army shows up to arrest you, the king's guard, you can say, well, no, these are expensive to make. We just, it's just a picture, we just threw it up there, right? So there's a complex interplay between text and image here. Um, it actually, uh, which complicates our attempts to use textual context to automatically label these because it's sometime working you know, ironically or direct contrast. It's not always a one-to-one -one correlation there. Um, we also have copies that get repurposed and they frequently move their way up the chain. Something can start as very crude kind of street art, move its way into a nicer engraving space and ultimately move its way up into you know, a piece of art. Uh, that was originally a European broadside. Um, woodcuts were their way up to some paintings um, from South America. So um, we have to deal with all of that. We'd use both old school and new school technology in our approach to do this. So we sold a lot of our stuff because we started working on this six years ago, I think, because when we started, uses good old school sort of feature points. Um, but we do some homography, and then we throw in some text mining approaches, most significantly a TF-IDF, this is just for those that know, to sort of identify what we think are the most salient features of an image. Um, on top of that, and this is, we were just hearing about this in some of the other presentations, um, we then start doing some cl similarity clustering. What we do is we build out this, excuse me, similarity network of the, the broadsides. And this is, becomes much more useful for us than the straight up matching, because it allows us to see what's sort of the next closest neighbor, right? Where do we see a same pose, but it's actually a totally different image, a totally, di you know, these are very different, but they all span out from my, we call this the artichoke lady, um, a particular fan that she's holding. And it turns out women holding a fan is a very iconographic pose in the period. Um, and so we start moving out from that. And based on that, um, a fundamental approach, we just do some thresholding. Uh, actually, I'll show you. This is my just a snippet of a similarity network of about 80% of the extant woodcut images, impressions that are known to exist um, from the 16th and 17th century that were printed in England. Um, and it's just a snippet, and you can see, you know, so we have some very close, tight density here, and it moves out, and this goes way out. And um, right away, this becomes really interesting, is you can start to look at the outliers, which I find most interesting. Like, what are the things that, that don't connect to anything else, right, in this otherwise very dense space? 
Um, so we use this to, within the EBA website, when you're looking at any uh, single broadside, you can go to a ballads tab or woodcuts tab, and it will take each one of them, and it just automatically searches the system and shows you all the other matches that it finds in that archive. Um, there's a lot more if you clicked on it, always gives you a maximum of these eight, and then you can click on the button and get the large view of all the matches and navigate your way around. You can also, from the website, from the home page, you can just download your own image. So if you have an image that you have from anywhere that you want to match against the archive, you just hit the upload button, go, and it will search the archive and bring you back that whole list. Um, and this works really well. It's live on the site. You can do it. It, it really does work well. Um, but the next space for us is moving into what we've been hearing about, which is using deep learning to allow us to ask a much deeper set of questions about these and to do some better classification. And in order to do that, the problem we were just hearing about is the problem of the labeling, right, which we don't have good labeling for these. Uh, most of these are uncatalogued completely. I mean, in fact, we've doubled almost the number of no, that have been known to exist since we started this archive. Because every time we walk into any library or museum, we go, just give us any box you have that's uncatalogued in any way that has this size could fit in. And we always find more um, that, that exists that no one ever even knew, the physical ones. So um, what we've done is we've built this into our cataloging interface, where the uh, cataloger, when looking at this, can, anytime they're looking at any impression of a cut, it shows them all the other ones. You'll notice these aren't all, maybe I picked a bad example, these maybe are all exact copies. Um, better example would have shown ones where they're similar, we start to move down the similarity network. Um, and they can just you know, look at, import, and so what people typically do is go, give me the, all the tags from that one, that one, that one, that one. We have a very thick set of metadata to choose from, the, the way we catalog these. And through that, to facilitate a process of building the tag set that we would need to be able to effectively apply a deep learning algorithm to classify this whole uh, image set. Um, because what we ultimately want to do is we want to be able to sort of have someone come in and ask more semantically driven questions about this. Like, give me every woodcut impression that's about royalty, right? Well, that's a very broad set of categories. And whether you think of it as sort of a, a human taxonomy approach to this um, or the layers of a neural net that you'd have to have, you start to get very, very, very deep layers. Like there's a lot of steps to get from an individual image to this individual sub-items that are in the image that are indicators of royalty that you would want to build up. So we need a lot of tagging. There are other collections. So we bring in collections from uh, all over the world, like libraries. We do deals with a lot of different libraries. Um, but there are a lot of these woodblock impressions that are, are not in broadside ballots that are outside of our universe. So we're starting to work with the Folger Shakespeare Library and the Varberg Institute, both of which have uh, collections that they have already cataloged and are interested in continuing to catalog. To catalog. But what, and what we're really hoping to do is build a network that to get everybody that has some of these in their collection to start using some software, ours happens to be totally open source, works really well, you can you know, download it, the URL, put the URLs just there at the end um, for anybody who's interested, but we really are actively seeking collaborators. People are interested in exposing their collections um, in an automated way so that we can exchange metadata right, about them so that I can know you have matches, here's the computational likelihood of that match, here's how we've described that match, Here's some information about the parts in it that we've described. And through that, by putting that all together, that will allow us much more quickly to get to a labeled training set that we need to actually be able to then ask these larger semantic questions that we really want to be able to ask. So um, I stand up here really with that plea. I don't, at the end, of all my cards on the table, I don't care if you used my software or somebody else's. It's more about collaborating to work together to come up with some standards for the metadata transfer. Right, so that we're all sending the same kind of information back and forth so that we could globally build these kind of training sets that we need to to apply. In my case, I'm in this broadside battle world, but it's a fundamental problem for anybody who's doing any kind of early modern medieval imagery that we need to work together to build these data sets. So with that, I will close and thank you.